Now that we're familiar with the terminology and a few of the special graphs that we will encounter, let's take a closer look at bipartite graphs. Let's take a look specifically at what is a bipartite graph. So we introduced this in the last video, um, but it was a very short introduction. So let's look a little more in depth. When we have a bipartite graph, we have a set of vertices that can be partitioned into two disjoint subsets. And it doesn't matter what you call those. Essentially what we're saying is you have a group of vertices and you can have one set and another set, and it doesn't matter if they're the same size, but within each set, notice there's no overlap, and there's no edge that's going to connect any vertices in the first set, we'll call this V1 and V2. So when I draw an edge connecting two vertices, it has to go from one set to the other set. So let's go and call this ABC12. So A1, A2, say B2, and C1. This is a bipartite graph because notice there's no line connecting any two vertices in the same subset. Now, most of the time, you're not going to have those circles around it. And sometimes you're also going to see it drawn in this way instead. So this would be the exact same bipartite graph where A connects to one and two, B connected to two, and C connected to one. So those are the same graph. As we can see, one way we're drawing them uh, so that the two sets of vertices are parallel in a vertical fashion, and here they're in a horizontal fashion. So again, that's what a bipartite graph is. So if we have a complete graph, a complete bipartite graph, that's where all the vertices in one subset connect to all the vertices in the other subset. So if I look back at this original, I would have to connect B, oops, B to one, and C would have to connect to two. Now notice A is connected to both one and two, B is connected to one and two, and C is connected to one and two. And we would call this K, just like we did in the last video for a complete graph, but instead of just one number, we would write three comma two to represent the fact that the first subset has three vertices and the second subset has two. Now let's take a look at two graphs that we know well from our last video. So again, I don't have the vertices here because I just used the shape tool to create these. But here is C6. C6 is the cycle graph with six vertices. And K3, which is the complete graph with three vertices. So each vertex connected to each other vertex. The question is, can I draw either of these as bipartite graphs? And the way that we do that is if we didn't have a strategy, we would just have to say, OK, let's go ahead and label these. Otherwise, we don't know what we're talking about. If we didn't have a strategy, we would just have to start and say, okay, what if A was over here? Well, A connects to B, so B has to be on this other subset, and B connects to C but doesn't connect to A, so it's possible that C is over here, and you can see where this can get confusing real quick to see whether or not a graph can be bipartite. So the way that we do this is actually something called graph coloring. Now we'll do this in much more detail in section 10.8, which is called graph coloring, um, but this is a nice preview. In graph coloring, we want to color the vertices of the graph so that no two vertices that are connected have the same color. So for instance, if I color A yellow, well B has to be a color other than yellow because it's connected to yellow. And I can also color F that same color green because A is yellow and connected to F, but F and B are not connected. If they were connected, they couldn't have the same color. So, and the point is that you use as few colors as possible. So again, for E, instead of say grabbing a blue color or a green color or a you know purple color, I'm going to go back to yellow because it's not connected to any other yellows. And I'm going to do the same for C because it's not connected to any other yellows. And as we can see, I can now use 
two separate colors. Sorry if those colors are confusing because they kind of look the same. So I'm going to change that yellow to blue just to be clear. Now, what's the point of graph coloring? Well, I have just shown that I can group these into two separate subsets, which is exactly what a bipartite graph is. So I know that I can redraw this graph as A, C, E, and the blue ones were B, D, and F, and then just connect as they are in the graph. So A is connected to B and F, and B is connected to A and C, and C is connected to B and D, and D is connected to C and E, and E is connected to D and F, and that's all of them. So that is our bipartite graph. Now, if we try the same thing for K3, if I start here at yellow, oops, I better give these some labels, A, B, C. So if I start here at yellow, I can see that I could use, say, the blue color for B, but I can't use yellow or blue for C because C is connected to both a yellow and a blue. So that means this graph has three colors and therefore it cannot be a bipartite graph because bi of course means two. Again, let's look at just one more. Um, let's look at C5, which is essentially a pentagon. So you can try this one on your own if you'd like. Again, A, B, C, D, E. And again, doing the same process, I would start here at A. I would say, well, B can be yellow and E can be yellow. Then I can make D white. But again, I can't make C white or yellow because it's connected to both a white and a yellow. So C5 cannot be bipartite because it uses three colors. Bipartite graphs are actually very useful when you're trying to organize um, anything that you can separate into two subsets. So for instance, if I want to organize instructors that are qualified to teach certain subjects, if I want to organize certain job duties and employees trained to do those job duties, I can organize that using a bipartite graph. So some of the terminology that we're going to be using here is matching. So when I'm talking about a matching, I'm looking at a subset of the set of edges so that no two edges are incident with the same vertex. So what I mean by that is I don't want to reuse any of the values or the elements in the first subset, and I don't want to reuse any elements in the second subset. Now, if it's a matching, it could be that I have someone who isn't matched. So a maximum matching is simply a matching with the largest number of edges possible, but really what we're hoping for is a complete matching, and a complete matching is essentially where I have every vertex in the su first subset matched with a vertex in the second subset and vice versa, which means every employee has a job and every job has an employee associated with it. So let's look at this pretend bipartite graph that I have created. Um, my first subset includes one, two, three, four. My second subset, A, B, C, D. Um, so again, quite often you're not going to have those circles there to denote the two subsets, but obviously it's very clear since one, two, three, four are not connected to one another and A, B, C, D are not connected to one another. So if I were looking for a complete matching, essentially what I'm saying is, can I find a matching so that one is connected to one of the jobs, two is connected to one of the jobs, three to one of the jobs, and four to one of the jobs. Now, we're not going to talk about algorithms on how to find a complete matching, um, but if you'll notice here, I could use two matched to C, I could use three matched to D, I could use four matched to B, and I could use one matched to A. So this is a complete matching because if you'll notice, every element in the first subset, one, two, three, four, are, is connected to an element in the second subset, and there are no isolated vertices, so everything is matched up. So here's a question for you to try, and again, you can try it on your own, or you can work through it with me. Essentially, what we have is we have four different 
employees trained in different job tasks. And we want to know, are we able to match each employee with just one job task so that every job task is being completed and that every employee is matched with a job? So how are we going to do it? We're going to first create a bipartite graph. So we have Alvin trained in HR and marketing. So Alvin goes to HR and marketing. Then we have Betty trained in development and marketing. So I have to have a new vertex for development and marketing. And Carlos trained in social media presence and development. and Devondre in HR. So the question is, can we find a complete matching or if not, find the maximum matching? So again, we're not talking about algorithms here, but common sense tells us that if you have someone like Devondre who has just one thing he or she, I guess I don't know if it's a boy or girl, <laughs> is able to do, you should match that. So Devondre is going to be matched to HR. And if you have a job task like social media presence that only one of your employees is able to do, then you should match that. So Carlos to social media presence. And then as we can see, we could match Betty with either development or marketing. And we could match Alvin with only marketing. So Alvin must go to marketing and then Betty is going to go to development. So this is a complete matching and it's a nice visual way to see this. So this brings us to the question, can we find a complete matching? So is there a mathematical way to know for sure whether there is complete matching from one subset to the other? And how do I do it? Well, Hall has a marriage theorem, and this basically stemmed from if you have certain individuals um, in one set who are willing to marry certain individuals in a second set, and in that second set you have certain individuals willing to marry individuals from their first set, are you able to come up with marriages so that every person gets married to someone they want to marry? Um, kind of a silly thing, but we'll go with it because that's where it stemmed from. And you will, in fact, have some marriage questions um, in your homework. So let's take a look at what Hall's theorem says. It says, if you have a bipartite graph, you will have a complete matching from the first subset. So again, we're talking about bipartitions, V1, V2. That's just fancy talk for you've got one subset, two subsets. So those are your bipartitions. There's a complete matching from V1 to V2 if and only if the neighborhood of A is greater than, I'm oh, sorry, the cardinality, so the number of elements in the neighborhood of A is greater than or equal to the number of elements in A for every subset A of V1. So let's take a look at what that means first, because there's a lot of math language in there. Let's say I choose a subset so this is a subset, a smaller grouping comprised of a set of V1, A and B. Well, let's take a look at the neighborhood of that subset. The neighborhood is how many elements or which elements are A and B adjacent to. So A is adjacent to one and to four and B is adjacent to two and three and four. So the neighborhood of my subset is there's four elements and there were only two elements in the subset. So that certainly holds true. Um, let's take a look at another subset. Let's do B and D. So B is adjacent to two and three and four and D is adjacent to one. So again, I've got two elements, but four elements in the neighborhood. And again, I could continue looking at that through all of the subsets. So all of the subsets of size two, of size three, and of course of size four. Well, let's take a look at my second example. What if I chose 
my subset of W and Y. Well, W is adjacent to 2, and Y is adjacent to 2. So I have two elements in the subset, but only one element in the neighborhood. So Hall's marriage theorem tells us that there's no way I can find a complete matching for my second example. And again, it makes perfect sense because if we tried to do this, we would see, let's say we match W to two. Well, Y can't get matched to anything because two has already been taken. So we can see that that's what Hall's marriage theorem is telling us. Again, it's not a great way because there's a lot of guess and check, but that's um, how you would apply that theorem. We're going to finish section 10.2 by taking a look at new graphs from old graphs.